very good morning. Welcome to Fair for Penistone on GB News. Here's what's coming up today. Uh, I'm also going to have my expert panel in the studio this morning. Political editor at The Express, Sam Lister, will join me alongside broadcaster and lawyer Andrew Ebor, and we'll get their thoughts on the millions of households facing a 5% tax increases from April. That's Sam's story on the front page of The Express today. And also why record numbers of women are not applying to university. Why might that be? Very good morning. This is Bev Turner today on GB News. My guests are here with me. Political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister. Good to see you, Sam. And broadcaster and lawyer, Andrew Ebon. Sam. Your story on the front page of The Express today. Uh, families facing the biggest council tax rise as Britain's fair being priced out of uh, life. What's this about? Yeah, we've had research from the County Council's network. They've gone through the budget documents of councils ac across the country. It's the biggest councils, the, one that, the ones that are responsible for social care. And those councils have the power to put up your bills by 4.99%. Uh, um, without having to kind of go to the, the local people. And three quarters have decided to do that. Uh, the the, the information is not completely uh, all there. Some councils haven't declared yet, but of the ones that have declared, three and four are going to put up bills by essentially 5%. A huge blow to people at a time of a cost of living crisis. It's about £100 on average, but that really varies on where you are in the country, what kind of council you've got. Mm. And in uh, rural councils, uh, they, they have much ha higher council tax bills. It's, it's more like £150 extra a year. So you've got a list in the paper here of the highest council tax bills in the current financial year yeah. and the lowest council tax bills. So where, where can people go, Sam? Do you, to, well, you're going to say Express. Pick up a copy of the Express. <laughs> 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 to find out if that's one of their councils. Yeah, you're well, kind of ahead of the game on this, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So we've, I mean, as I say, we, we've used this county council network research. They've done, I have to say, they've done the hard work. They've gone through these documents. But actually, uh, you'll find that the lowest um, council tax, tax bills, nine of them are in London. And that's because London councils get an awful lot more in terms of subsidies from the government. Right. So you, you've got a lower tax bill in London, you've got much higher costs elsewhere, mm. but in, it, actually your council tax bills are lower. Now, I've had an awful lot of reaction on social media, huge amounts to this story, and people mm. are just saying, look, my bins aren't being collected as often as they used to be. There's potholes all over the, the roads that haven't been filled. Our services are being reduced mm. and our bills are going up and, and people are pretty furious, I have I, to say. I'm not surprised, do you, Andrew? Well, I think that, that, that is the issue, isn't it? You've got to work out, if you need extra money, where's it going to come from? And, and a great article, if only I could meet the journalist who wrote it. <laughs> yeah, well, we I know, It's fantastic. Uh, but they've got it, and you've done your little, little list of shame. Where you can find out is go to your local council website mm. and they will tend to you. You're in Lambeth, aren't you, I yes, think? Yes, I am. Yeah. And yours is only 1.99%, I can tell you, if you didn't know. Uh, mine, however, is 4.99%, I'm in Westminster, so that's shot up accordingly. Although there is this sort of name and shame list where actually sort of the people at the top, uh, Rutland is going up by 2,300 and, and, and threepence, mm. uh, a bizarre figure. Yeah. Uh, but that's what it's going. But Nottingham, oh, Dorset that. Council. Just, just, just in that, case that, you, that's the current yeah, year's bill. In case you're in yeah. Rutland and you yes. panic, you can't <laughs> like going up by 2,000 pounds. We just want to clarify. Panic on the streets of Rutland. I never want to do that. It's going to be good. Um, but they do say, but the, the reason in the county areas, historically they've received lower government money mm. and that's why they need to try and find the money somewhere what you need to do is basically have a spreadsheet you need to turn around and say this is how much all the services cost and this is where the money is coming from to pay for it and people need to start hassling their local MPs. Yeah. that's what i'm yeah. realizing contact them they've been you know people haven't been enraged by this sort of local stories for, for almost since for decades as long as i can remember yeah and maybe it's just my age right but it just feels like right now we're getting a terrible service we're getting terrible service, and we're paying more and more for it have they explained to sam at all why they feel they need it yeah they say that it's the uh, it's the kind of worst time to be setting a local council budget in a decade that yes. actually the, the, the inflationary uh, yeah. impact on their own bills has had a huge yeah. um effect on things like leisure centers obviously mm -hmm. heating swimming pools has become really expensive yeah. uh, school transport has become really expensive because of increasing fuel prices uh, and also the, the cost of filling potholes mm. the cost of materials and contractors has gone up so they're they're saying that actually we're feeling the squeeze too but i would just point out there's there's three council areas that where if you're a resident in croydon slough or thurrock you're going to face uh, a rise of 10 percent in slough wow. and thurrock and 15 percent in croydon wow. and that's because those councils have been so badly run they've basically gone bust 
and taxpayers are now going to have to kind of foot the bill for that is there, uh, ineptitude. Is there, if, you, if you're listening and watching at home, let me know what you think about this, won't you? GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email address. Because I'd love to know whether you feel like you're getting value for money from your, your taxpayers' money in these local areas. Um, do we know whether there's a distinction between whether they are predominantly Labour areas or Conservative councils? I think it's, it's, it's widely spread because it's essentially it's three quarters of councils, so it, it, in a way it really doesn't kind of matter. Uh, it's more to do with are you uh, London or non-London, right. are you rural I was just or wondering city. whether it was some of the Labour councils playing politics a bit with an election on the horizon and saying, well, look, if you've got a Conservative... Yes. Government, you're going to have to pay more. They've I, not given, you know. It's important to question everything. You should absolutely yeah, look at yeah, that. Absolutely. And in the follow-up article, we can summarise both. We'll put both. Talking <laughs> about questioning everything. Yes. Some people are quite disappointed that they're not UFOs. Oh. Let me tell you, <laughs> some people were quite looking forward to the fact that we might have a distraction with being invaded by UFOs, but we're not actually, are we, Andrew Iborn? Uh, uh, well, These are spy Iborn, uh, isn't yeah, it? Iborn. <laughs> <laughs> An unfortunate Spying vowel things. movement at this time of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Iborn, that's going to go. And well, some people say we are being invaded. The, the, the star who never failed to let oh. us down, they say it is that. Um, I find it extraordinary, the story, because it sounds so low-tech yeah. for spying. <laughs> what, you put up a balloon and you've got somebody looking down on you. It doesn't make sense to me. And if you shoot it down, don't you then scramble and say, well, here's the kit and well, this is what, what proves Americans you. Well, that's what the have now done, isn't and it? And have, have they said they found something? They're taking some sort of hexagonal metallic structure out of the water. I, I, don't, I just can't help but feel we might be being played here. <laughs> like, sure, surely China has always spied on America and, and UK. Yeah. We are probably doing something similar, aren't we? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know and I wouldn't want to declare if I did. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm sh surely these things must be always going on. I, I'm sure they are, and uh, uh, absolutely. But I think um, Lord Haig, he's obviously a former foreign secretary, he was saying this morning that actually this is embarrassing for both China and for the US. It's embarrassing for China that their low-tech balloon has been spotted. It's embarrassing for the US that they've allowed this to, to infiltrate their airspace. But what struck me was the, the, the actual embarrassing thing, I think, for, for the US is the fact that they did put it out there that they can't rule out uh, extraterrestrial, uh, in, you know, infiltration of their airspace. Which then led to the, the White House has then had to make a statement saying, we don't think this is uh, alien behaviour. Um, and, and number 10, our, our uh, official spokesman for the Prime Minister yesterday was asked by uh, my colleagues, mm. you know, do, do we, is the Prime Minister concerned about the possibility of extraterrestrial, uh, you know, involvement in these balloons and he had to say no you know look he's, he's more con more concerned about terrestrial matters like cancer you know than alien life force but sending it, balloons over it, the world I thought, I thought Rishi Sunak's response was quite interesting to this Andrew because he was like you know I will keep you safe yes. we will keep you safe yes. there's this rhetoric from the government about keeping us safe Margaret Thatcher wasn't bothered whether we were safe. Well, I think she I was, but she never sort of touted in that sort of way. And yeah, but this patrician role, yeah. stop, stop nannying me. I, it's my job to keep myself and, and safe. And who and it's what we always say, it's about communication, isn't it? Yeah. Is that the message he's being told to peddle people? Because fear, as you know, yeah. the father of PR, uh, Edward Bernays, he always said the best way of saying anything is through fear. Uh, people are scared of whether it's little green men coming or women or either coming down and, and invading us or they're yeah. scared of things being on high alert and a lot of the people talk about these typhoon planes being mm. ready. They're always ready. You know, it's not That's right. because That's of not the, the balloons. It's not news. So the headlines that scream that yeah. we're going to be all these sort of problems, they've got issues. But I can tell you that the actual biggest threat is not from weather balloons. Mm. It's actually from tech. And the other story in the news at yes. the moment is talking about these drones that the police are using, mm. which come from Chinese firms. Mm. And that's a much easier, cleverer yeah. way of infiltrating if that were to be the case. Yeah. So they should look at that as well. Fantastic. Right. Uh, you've been getting in touch. Thank you. We were talking about the China spy balloons. And John has said China has around 300 satellites, of which 100 are military grade, and could read a tombstone in a graveyard. Why on earth would they need a balloon to spy on the UK? That's what you were saying, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, and also, the council tax bill, it's the front page of Sam's paper this morning. Uh, Craig says, I'm disgusted that council tax bills are going up considerably yet again. I live in Bridge North in South Shropshire. We have poor road conditions, street lights going off at 10 o'clock, bins emptied once a fortnight, schools in disrepair, cuts in transport services and bus routes. I am shocked. You are not alone, Craig. Right, uh, Andrew Eborn, Sam yes. are still with me. So, yesterday, 
We had this report from Labour about the fact that the Conservatives have spent all this money on these, um, they're not allowed to call them credit cards, these uh, government um, procurement cards. Sounds so, so catchy, doesn't, doesn't it? Doesn't yes. it? <laughs> well, I think it's meant to deliberately confuse you. Never leave one. home without one, is what I would <laughs> say. Never leave without my procurement card. Well, of course, what then subsequently happened since yesterday is that the... Um, uh, the Conservative press have hit back. It was always going to happen. And now they are very cross about the fact that Angela Rayner uh, spent money on an iPad and AirPods, yes. and they consider those a luxury item. I... This story just doesn't fly from any direction, <laughs> does it? <laughs> well, what I love, I always say history repeats itself because people don't learn the lessons from history and uh, take the speck out of your eye before trying to remove yeah, the, all of those sort of things. So absolutely, this, so that is basically the story. She's trying to justify the fact that she can't just have any old headphones. You have to be able to have the best, highest 249 quids worth of earphone uh, to make it work. And she's justifying that uh, because it needs to sync with the other luxury <laughs> items that she has uh, uh, around. Um, it is about that sort of hypocrisy. Yeah. You do need to, if you're going to call something out, make sure your own house is in order. Yeah. And it won't be. Do you think this was a bit of a non-story when you saw it yesterday, Sam? Yeah, I thought it. I thought it was quite clever how they'd done it. It was clever. Uh, they, they've got an awful lot of attention from the media, from the newspapers, for, from mm. broadcasters. That's exactly what they wanted. We're all talking about it. It's yeah. on. The, it was on the front page of the Guardian. It's been inside the papers again today. So it's job done for Labour, really. Well, it plays into that idea, doesn't it? The Conservatives are not like us. They're yeah. just very profligate. And they're yeah. spending all our money and they don't care. Yeah. From that, in that case, it was a win. But actually, when you actually drill down into the details, a lot of, you know, governments spend money. A lot of these foreign trips. Mm. Now, when, when you go on these foreign trips, a prime minister cannot be expected to stay uh, in a small B and B mm. because they need to have proper security. Yeah. And so they've got to they've got to be put in a, a place that can be properly secured by the, the security people. They also need the staff there. Now, you know. <laughs> I get that people don't like government spending money, but you, you, you do have to accept that sometimes they do have to buy um, expensive hotel rooms or, yeah. you know, for, for, for reasons that are beyond their control. These big summits that they go to, you know, all leaders are told which hotel to stay in by the host nation because they'll do security assessments. Um, so, you know, it's a, when, if Labour take power at the next election, which they clearly uh, are hoping to do, they will be in exactly the same position. Mm -hmm. So when we look at their data in uh, two or three yeah. years' time, we, we will find exactly the same data. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, right, let's move on to another piece in your paper today, Sam. This is written by a friend of GB News, Ben Habib. He is... Um, he's not a politician. So, well, he was. He was in the Brexit party, wasn't he? And Ben has written this piece... Um, in your paper, which is basically saying, and it's brilliant, and if, you, if, it, if the Brexit issue is kind of complicated, his piece is, is really good because it makes it incredibly simple to understand where we're going wrong, Andrew. Yeah. Yes. And his frustration is Brexit has not been done. We haven't Brexited. He uses it as a verb as opposed yeah. to the noun, doesn't he? We haven't had, we haven't done Brexit. What, what are the reasons he gives for why? Well, the basic, and that's the problem, because Boris was elected fantastic 80-seat majority on the basis, we'll get Brexit done. Yeah. Uh, and he's trying to say, well, what, what, what does that mean? And what Ben says, you're right, in that brilliant article, in a fantastic newspaper, glad we got a journalist from there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it works on that sort of basis. They, they've got, we've left the EU's commission, its council, its parliament, and its court. Um, the EU single market and the customs union, you've got that sort of side. And the principle about taking back control of our laws, our borders, our cash, and our fish. Is, is what, what they're sort of basically saying. Um, but there's still sort of issues because you sort of turn around and say, look, how are things different yeah. in that sort of basis? There are so many laws to be unpicked because it still feels as though um, it's taking that long sort of process. Yeah. And, and that's the sort of problem. You've got to work out, well, what does leaving, what does Brexit actually mean, apart from being turned into a verb? That's right, because he says, we've left the EU's commission, its council, its parliament, its course, but that does not constitute Brexit. The frustrations, Sam, for, from people who were uh, Brexiteers is profound. It's yeah. just building every day, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I think he makes the point that actually we haven't left as one United Kingdom. Mm. There is still this issue to be resolved with Northern Ireland. Yeah. It's still um, subject to EU rules. Um, and until that's resolved, then, you know, we haven't completed Brexit. Uh, that, that there seems to be, we seem to be edging towards a, a solution on that, but I don't think it's one that's necessarily going to be acceptable to all Brexiteers because it sounds like the government is willing to compromise on whether the mm. uh, you know European courts still have some role to play. Yeah. And I think they, the government would say that, and obviously this is all kind of uh, nothing has been signed off yet, but I think the government would say that uh, actually 
it, it's a very, it would be a very minimal role and we would have uh, control over whether things went to the European Court in the first place. But I think you're going to find a whole big Brexit row coming up in yeah. the next few weeks. And, and it's, it's also about sort of soundbite politics, mm. isn't it? Because when you ask the electorate, do you want to be in or out, mm. the, the consequences of that need to be explained. You need to turn around and say, well, what does that mean? Yeah. We've got zillions of laws, a lawyer, as you know, uh, and you work on that sort of basis. You say, well, we've got to unpick this and that and everything else. What it basically means is we then have to negotiate with the rest of the world to put other things back in place. Mm. So I think when you're explaining it, you, and then Ben starts on that sort of process, you need to say, look, this is what it means in practice. Yeah. And Conservative MPs, they, they, they are frustrated because they want to be able to show on the doorstep, this is the reason why we did it. Look, these are some tangible results from why we went through all this. And one of the big ones is control of uh, the UK's borders. Mm. And obviously, because of the small boats crisis and, and, and how um, many more people are coming over through that route, and also actual uh, legal migration rising, they're saying that actually they cannot present, you know, on the doorstep yeah. that we have taken back control of our borders yeah. in a way that they would want to. And do you think there's any faith that if Keir, Star well, if Keir Starmer gets in, that Brexit will be safe in his hands? Well, that, that is a suspicion. And actually, Conservative MPs say that if, if you want to make sure that he cannot reverse it, you have to get rid of all the inherited laws we've got. And they're trying to do that by the end of the year. It's going to be very difficult to do that. But they fear that if that doesn't happen and Keir Starmer does come in, then you will start to see this slight unravelling of Brexit. Yeah. And that's the problem. Going back to the soundbite, though, you'd say if Boris turned around and said, get Brexit done, the question is, have you? Yeah. Right. Um, women going to university or Sadiq Khan's... Um, Sadiq. Sadiq Khan. Well, in interesting, oh. isn't it? Slammed over nonsense data is what they're saying on, on this sort of basis. This is about the ULES yep. uh, thing, um, where basically a scheme charging motorists £12.50 a day to drive in London. Uh, people are opposing that so they, uh, because Bromley's council leader, a certain Colin Smith, uh, he said that the commission uh, a report by City Hall chose to ignore Bromley's much older population. So what, uh, what Sadiq was saying is that in Bromley, it's got the t most toxic air of all. There's a higher death rate, higher excess death rate yeah. as a result of it. And the usual sort of thing about causation or correlation. Are the statistics right? No, because he's cut the books. He's basically chosen a, a, a constituency with much higher age and a, an older population. Um, what what's, the, what's your paper stand on these low traffic neighbourhoods, Sam? Because a lot of people do not like them. No, they don't. And I think it, it just moves the problem. You know, it just moves the problem. It doesn't solve the problem, does it? So no. you, you you create these little kind of middle class protected zones. That's right. And, and with this, I mean, I, I would say, you know, they kind of go hand in hand, don't they, these low traffic neighbourhoods and the ULES scheme. And the, I would just say on the ULES scheme, it's a London thing, but this will spread. I mean, it's already, it's is, already well. spreading and it will and it will just continue. It's, it's, it's spreading to our cities at the moment. It will spread to towns. Yeah. And it is a tax on, on working people because if you drive a van, for example, to, to, to do your trade, mm -hmm. This is going to hit you. I mean, my, you know, I, I already know people who've been hit by it trying to drive into London. And I live in a ULA zone. I had some friends yeah. come and stay at the weekend from Wales. Um, £25. By the time they've yeah. driven their car to park on my drive, £12.50, drive it off a yep. few yeah. days later. Yeah. £25 yeah. adds the weekend when yeah. they're already paying a huge amount of petrol yep. costs. Um, coming into London, spending a huge amount of money on food and drink. Yeah. It's, it, I, I, he seems tone deaf to me. Yeah. Well, it, it also, you've got to think about the knock-on effect, because you're right, if it puts people off yeah. coming into London, does that then have a knock-on effect for the shops? Mm. And that's my point. So a lot of it, you talked about the shopkeepers, the restaurants and so on and so forth, who are really suffering, yeah. having had no trade during lockdown, or minimal trade. Mm. What's going to happen to that? So uh, firstly, get the statistics right. If they're, not, if they're wrong and you're not telling the truth about them, let's address that. Secondly, look at the consequences. And it's about the trust, isn't it? Because his because statistics aren't right. Like we don't, we don't trust you, Sadiq Khan, on this issue in any way, shape or form. We aren't seeing, as residents of London, we aren't walking out of our front door and, chop and coughing and choking because the air is so bad. Maybe there are things that we don't know. However, we've got to... It comes back to what I was saying earlier about this idea that the, the London Mayor is there to keep us safe. Well, do you know yeah. what will keep us safe? Tackle knife crime, give me a security guard on the tube and on the buses. That will make people feel safe. This is just killing our high street and it's anti-motorist 
And I just, you know what I fear, Andrew? I know you're a futurist. You can look into your crystal ball. Hey. I feel like the future is just going to be lots of men riding around on bicycles while the women are at home with all the <laughs> and all the paraphernalia that we need to leave the house. Is, is, is that right? Yeah. You, you think that's the future? It's all your fault. It is my fault. I take the blame. I've got right. broad shoulders. We've got to the end of the first hour. Wow, we packed lots in. Now, um... I will keep you safe, says uh, Rishi Sonak. Uh, are you fed up of being Molly Coddle? We'll be back in just a few minutes. OK, we are here on the panel. I'm joined by political editor of The Daily Express, Sam Lister, and broadcaster and lawyer, Andrew Eborn. You know what? Anything can happen on this show. And, and it usually does. Which is why <laughs> we love it. Does. We love flying television. It's got to be good. Oh, I love flying by the seat of my pants. Let me tell hey. you. Maybe right. that's what happened. It was not the balloons. It was you flying by the seat of your pants <laughs> up in the air. <laughs> that would be the one. Most days, I feel like I am. Right. Hey. OK, this is a bad news story, yes. Andrew Eborn. It's partly because of you. It's, it's totally my fault. <laughs> Whenever it's bad news, it's my fault. This is about our future move towards electric vehicles. Yes. And I don't think we have thought this through. If okay. I had a pound for every story when I yes. should start with saying that. Ford have cut 1,300 jobs in Britain as it shifts production towards electric vehicles. Yep. Are you completely convinced that electric vehicles are the way forward? I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, and again, it's not as, uh, I don't want to say this, but I did tell you so. And it's something that we've been speaking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get worse. Because it's not just the, the one... Th Firstly, my heart goes out to these. These are jobs and Absolutely. families and, and that sort of stuff. And it's whilst we make light of certain things, the loss of jobs is horrendous. It is something we warned about for yeah. a long time. What's going to happen is not just the move to electric cars, it's actually the move to robotics, yes. replacing the workforce and so on and so forth. So what we need to look at, any job, as I've said for years, any job that can be automated will be. And uh, Jack Ma, uh, he predicted uh, exactly that. It's going to be an existential threat to the way that the workforce is, is constructed. So it's a predictable story. It's tragic that it's 1,300 jobs. There will be more. Yeah. And I think that, that's the issue. It's because the, um, the way that the cars are made, as you say, means that there's significantly less work to be done on drive trains moving out of combustion engines. It's just the robots are making these cars. And, yeah. and I, my, father, my father and my father's father fixed cars. That was our family business when he sold it a few years ago with the 100-year-old car business. Now, we have to move with the time, Sam, but I'm not sure whether we've thought through what these people do instead of making cars. I mean, th these are these are highly qualified jobs. You know, these are good jobs that, 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 that we're going to lose here as a, as a country, and that is a great shame. And it is... Um, you know, the, go the government is constantly being asked to think about the jobs of the future. Mm. But obviously, long-termism in government is, is always difficult, as we know. Um, and really, we need to find a way of... Every industry is constantly evolving. You know, the journalism industry is not the same industry that I started in 20 years ago. Staff have been cut because of advances in technology. It makes yeah. the job easier to do. You can, um, you know, you don't need people to take copy down the phone like uh, yeah. you used to 20 years ago. You can do it on your phone. So I love those days. They were great days. I remember phoning through <laughs> copy and reading yeah. out, somebody typing it on the other end. Yeah. And there'd, there'd be some fabulous mistakes made down the line, yeah. you know. But, um, but you know, the, the, every industry has to evolve, and that is the sad reality. And, and jobs are, are, are always lost. But the, the key thing is, how do we find good quality employment for, for yes. these people in the future. Uh, I think the, the government wants to kind of go down the green technology route, um, but, you know, it, there's an awful long way to go on that. But a lot of the green technology will also be made by robots. Yes. It will involve yeah. AI. D I don't know whether you've ever read that speech that Matt Hancock gave in 2017, um, launching the fourth industrial revolution and introducing Klaus Schwab on stage, and he said, you know, if you don't much like change, I have no good news for you. And, and he talks about the dirty, the dangerous the difficult jobs being done by AI and yeah, robots, and he's absolutely. got a point. But then he says, and that leaves people to do the creative and artistic jobs. Yeah. I'm not sure that bloke who was making cars in yeah. Ford yeah. wants to spend his day doing a watercolour. No, <laughs> and, but also, I can tell you, the watercolours are also being done by AI. We've yeah. got chatbots now mm -hmm. turning around, and I've spoken about this. They are uh, affecting the creative industries. Journalism, mm -hmm. they can start doing all of that sort of stuff. So the creative industries were affected. Yeah. Um, you've got Moon Pig. We talk about Valentine's Day. Yeah. Love is in the air as well as no balloons. Um, yeah. The reality is it's writing poems. 
challenge. One of the things that Moonpig is now offering is a chatbot which will give you your artificial roses and red, violets or whatever. Um, you work on that sort of principle. So creative industries, every industry is going to be affected. And I'm not being the prophet of doom, I've said this for years. What I will say is that look at alternative ways. Throughout history, we've had technological advancements, the industrial revolutions, where people burnt pre uh, printing presses and so on and so forth. You need to look at what the future is going to hold. That gave people jobs. I can't see what people are going to do to make a living. Well, you're going to have more leisure time for people, certainly. And the that's trouble just is, people make us all fat and lazy. Well, <laughs> and, people, and people will live longer, which is why you've got to think. Well, fat and lazy, they were. Well, 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 maybe that's the idea, then, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, but, no, but it is that principle. You've got to look at the basic sort of understanding as what's going to happen with technology. Every job that can be automated will be automated, and every job you need to look at and say. Could I be replaced by AI or robotics? And the answer is yes. We need to flatten the learning curve so people can prepare for the future. Well, I'm all very pleased with you getting excited about it, but you've not given me any solutions as to what people are going to do instead. Uh, they will have leisure time. Um, they will but have leisure time. We don't need leisure time. But, 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 we need but, purpose. We need to get up in the morning and want to go to work. And human beings need a sense of purpose, Sam. I really agree. Maslow's hierarchy of need. Yeah. We have our food, we have our shelter, and then we need fulfilment and philosophical... Um, uh, satisfaction at the yeah. top of our pyramid. We're yeah. losing it. Yeah. But I think, and also, I, I would slightly um, question the fact that we're going to get more leisure time because actually, for, for many, many years, that's always been the kind of offer that we, yeah. we kind of um, take over these jobs through uh, robotics and, and AI and that kind of thing, and we get more leisure time. Actually, we don't. Our working week has just gone up and up You're and right. up. So people who are working we just end up working off. longer, longer hours. Yeah, and yeah, you go home and you do your emails on your phone, yeah. and you switch off. So your solution of more leisure time <laughs> is not coming. <laughs> oh, your I'll homework, go and find some jobs <laughs> of the future that are going to be satisfying. Coding, like, these coding. These people, coding, I can't think of anything I'd rather do less. That's why we should say it wants people to do math till 18, isn't it? There so they'll all become so data become, robots. Yeah. There you go. Right, talking of education, a record 10,000 fewer young women uh, applied for university for this September, um, particularly it looks like in the nursing and the teaching industry. What I industries? What, what else is the, the, the kind of the detail of this? Sam, it's a funny story. Yeah, it's it's suggesting that, that there's been a big fall in applications from women because the number of people applying to nursing courses has dropped and teaching courses where um, it's traditionally more um, female-led. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, th th this drop, it's, it's saying that actually during the pandemic... Um, there was a spike in nursing applications because people were inspired by mm -hmm. what they'd seen, by nurses going out there and, and doing their bit to help people. And and, on the street. Yeah, and absolutely. But, but since then, I think people have seen the reality. Obviously, the nurses are out on strike. Yeah. There is a pay dispute. Um, they, they feel undervalued. It's, it's incredibly hard work. Uh, and so, so that has really tailed off. And it says the number of applicants uh, to nursing courses fell by 18.6%. And for teaching, it was down by 15.6%. It's huge. It's a huge, it's a huge training amount. For jobs of the future. Yeah, and you know these are high demand professions. And so, where are these um, people going to come from in the future? You know, mm. three, four years down the line, we, we're already struggling. There's already a massive uh, number of vacancies. I think from memory, it's about 45,000 vacancies, nursing vacancies. We've already got a huge and number midwives. of jobs to fill. Yeah, yeah and, and this is only going to get worse because three years time, we're going to have even more shortages if these figures are very, correct. Yeah, it's very depressing. This Andrew. Well, I, but you've also got to put it into context because you must remember that beforehand there was a spike. Yeah. So when you're saying it's fallen, what happened is you need to look over a period of time. During the pandemic, the number of applicants choosing to study nursing surged. Mm. So you need to look at that sort of side. Well, how much did it surge by and so on and so forth? Also, this report, and, and we've got the head, sort of headlines here, they talk about the number of young women. You've got to look across the workforce. It's not just women, it's so on and so forth. Uh, and those figures, so a total of 59,000, uh, sorry, 596, 590 people applied for undergraduate courses mm. in the UK institutions by the January deadline. That was down 2.3% from the same point last year. The question is, why? Is it because they can't afford it anymore, mm. because uh, of, of other issues? Do they want to get out and start earning? Or are they no longer interested in these jobs? And, of course, we had... We had it, uh, the situation last September was, it was very difficult to get onto a course because so many people had deferred their entries right. during lockdown. Mm. We got a kind of bit of a backlog, actually, yeah. so that students who had even done really well in their A-levels didn't get, did, just got rejected. Extraordinary. Um, and so I think a lot of people have gone away and maybe come up with an alternative. 
university doesn't look as appealing anymore. Obviously, it's very expensive. Yep. People are worried about money. And there was also a, a line in this report about the fact that more universities are taking non-British applicants because they get more money from the international students. Yeah. That makes a bit of a mockery of Brexit, doesn't it? Well, no, but that's always been the case. Uh, yeah. uh, foreign students have always paid more, um, and universities, they need to get the money. So it, it's the same way as we've touched on mm. councils beforehand. You need to look at the money flow. And you've got to work out, and behind all of these headlines, and as I say, we try to make sure we stay away from yeah. fear-mongering, you try to say, why is it? Why Universities need money to survive. How are they going to get it? Mm. Well, you'll be delighted to know that there was a, a rise in people applying to study computing by nearly <laughs> uh, 10%, and law by 2%. Hang on, look, lawyers and computers, see? That's, that's the profession. It's yeah, got to well. be good. Right, OK. Still to come. It is Valentine's Day, of course. Bye. Many of us. <laughs> Andrew Eborn. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, the purse strings are tight. We'll find out some innovative ways that people are getting around this. And it involves a gummy ring, apparently. That's after your morning's news. Thank you, Ellie. Now, my panel are back with me. I am delighted to be my political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, broadcaster and lawyer, Andrew Eborn. Right, Sam, this story today about GP shortages, shortages meaning that family doctors are looking after uh, 3,000 patients. That sounds like a lot for a family doctor. Huge number, huge number, and it's gone up quite dramatically. So um, the number of fully, uh, fully qualified full-time GPs has fallen by 7% in six years. So... Um, so, yeah, you've got about 3,000 on average, but it really varies across the country. Mm. If you're in Blackburn with Darwin, you're in trouble. That's, that's the kind of worst place to be in, in terms of uh, the, your access to GPs. Uh, other badly affected areas are Portsmouth, Hull and Oldham. Um, but Liverpool, you, you're all right. There's quite a lot of GPs in Liverpool. So it really is... A, the, the, this is Lib Dem research. They're saying it's a postcode lot, lottery, and it really does seem to be dependent on where you are. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of issues with, with GPs in that um, there is a, a kind of pension tax tap track tax trap that they call it mm -hmm. uh, so if you a long-serving gp um you, you're paying into your pension there the becomes a point where it's not actually worth being at work because you're penalized with your pension um, and i think that has led to quite a lot of very senior doctors leaving the uh, profession over yeah. the last few years it's, it's a big problem across the nhs actually not just in uh, gp um uh, you know G gp professions mm. it's, it's actually in consultants and across the nhs yeah. um and that is something that the i know the government is looking at but it's it's one of a number of priorities for the budget. It's only if, you know, inflation comes down, if there's a little bit of extra money, they will look at uh, sorting out this problem, and yeah. that might help, but that doesn't really help people right now. You know, Andrew, when I'm looking at these figures, and it is interesting that it's analysis by the Liberal Democrats, this is a bit like Labour doing the digging... Question into, everything. ...isn't yep. it? It's like the Labour doing the digging into the expenses, though, this week as well. You can tell that there's going to be... We're going to be running up to an election probably in, in, in probably 8 to 12 months. Um... So you have to take some of these, some of these figures which are found by rival parties with a right. little pinch of salt, I always think. But these figures are huge. And I can't quite work out why. It's not that we've necessarily got fewer GPs, but um, we've got an extra 4 million patients have regist registered with the family doctors since 2016. Yeah. That's a huge number of it, people. It is a huge number. And you're right, as we always say, look, dig beneath the story. Why is this story coming out now? Yeah. Who's feeding mm. this narrative? And why is it happening? I mean, you, you touched earlier on about uh, the, the pension pot yeah. and the cap on the pension pot, and they are looking at that sort of side. It was a news story that broke uh, this week, and actually they touched on it previously, to say that we can encourage people back to work by giving them tax breaks if they can invest more in the pension. Because yeah. people turn around and say, well, why should I work anymore? Yeah. If I don't want to be the richest person in the graveyard, yeah. I want to have an incentive to do that. Also, what it will do, and I know you, you always <laughs> love it when I say this, gonna it's going to accelerate uh, artificial intelligence and it's going to accelerate robotics within the medical field. And I always say, imagine if you could have a doctor's surgery uh, which could be connected to the best medical intelligence in the world, and all doctors could benefit from that. What will happen is you're going to get earlier diagnosis, and earlier diagnosis will mean that people get cured earlier and so on and so forth. We're going to get missed 
diagnosis. Let me tell you what happens when I go into my GP. They've got one of those screens yes. where you go in and you put your date of birth in and then it will tell you the doctor's ready to see you. It's always got an out-of-order sign on the front of it. It's, it doesn't believe your Nothing date of birth. Nothing works anymore. It knows you're much younger than that. <laughs> That's what happens. Nothing works. This is the problem. This drive towards tech and a future of digital to save the NHS. Yeah. Nothing works, Andrew. Well, it's, 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 it's certainly right to a certain point. Some of it breaks down in your direct results. Of it. It's wrong to say nothing works. Well, I, 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 some, something. Well, <laughs> I, electricians, that's a good job for people, so get, get a few sparkies. Yeah. Um, no, the reality is, it is going to work, it's going to get better. It's understanding, that's what we try and do on this show. We, we turn around and explain what's going to happen. And as a futurist, that's exactly what we're going to try and do, prepare people for, for the future. What does that, yeah, but a GP, the whole point, Sam, of a GP is, it is the personal, uh, sort of, it is the human face of your health journey, right? I don't want a a screen well, the, to go in and type in what's yeah. wrong with you, what are your symptoms, type it in. Right, we're going to give you a little box of pills on your way out. Yeah. The, the, the way my uh, local GP has dealt with this is to effectively put in so many layers before you can actually ever get to the GP. So if you ring up, you're asked what, what, why are you ringing up, then you are referred to um, a clinician, unspecified, yeah. who then rings you takes you through a questionnaire, oh. then you get to see somebody, but it's not a doctor, and they don't actually tell you when you get there. Um, it's another clinician who then takes you through another questionnaire, and then you might get a call back, or then you might be able to see an actual doctor. But, you know, you've, they, what they're doing is trying to weed out minor cases, yeah. which actually Does makes a lot of sense. Like a good but, idea to well, you? Look, I'll tell you what it's doing. It's accelerating the need for the real cases. And everybody recognises that if you can reduce waiting times by two two things, one is earlier diagnosis, but secondly, getting rid of that admin side of it, yeah. that has got to be an advantage. And I speak to a lot of doctors. I speak at conferences. I talk about technology and how the power that it can unleash. Uh, we help them prepare videos in terms of getting patients ready for their first experience. All of that will help reduce waiting time. No, I don't agree. You and I will fight about this till we're all <laughs> living in your robotic world. <laughs> I don't agree, and I just think there are so many... T I think maybe it's, maybe it's as a woman as well. We have quite complicated um, health needs because often, you know, we, we birth children, just to point out. I don't, we still do, amazingly. I'll, I'll do you. I haven't got right. to do that for us yet. Right. It's only a matter of time. But, you know, we, have, we are this multiple, multifaceted, sophisticated system of pipes and tubes and, you know, various things that work. And we don't want to have those conversations with a robot. But it's not just conversations, but it's other things as well. It's earlier diagnosis, so it's not taking completely out the human element. It's speeding up the, the boring admin stuff, the stuff which takes a lot of time, and it takes it away from the expertise. So <sighs> if and like you're working on that sort of basis, you'll still have your personal touch. I don't... I just don't care. I want more human beings, more doctors, more nurses. Let's put the power back in the hands of doctors. We've had that, enough of that taken away the last few years. Um, we had a, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about uh, whether you missed it. If you missed the show, why? You can <laughs> see it back on the app, on the GB News app. And we were talking to William Sitwell, restaurateur, about tipping and the complications in this country particularly. We're quite awkward about yes. it, aren't we? And you've all been getting in touch on this. It really did light up the inbox. And David has said, absolutely no problem in asking for the service charge to be removed. I did this only the other day in a chain restaurant always tip separately in cash and this ensures that the tip goes to the staff who served you i usually check the size of the bill before deciding how much cash to give sam do you find it awkward when the service charge bit come, of the bill comes around i i prefer it to be included and then do i can you? just do it all on my card um are you a politician <laughs> one of those procurement cards, is it? <laughs> i couldn't possibly comment um, but i do know it's funny because i spend uh, if i'm not in london i'm in yorkshire and i do notice there is a difference in, in london it's automatically added in yorkshire it very rarely is yes. and i think there is more resistance in Yorkshire to just having it automatically added because people want to whereas in London people just want to pay it on the card they don't carry cash and they just want it to be really quick so I've noticed a difference yes. I'm wildly stereotyping but that's my experience no, I think between you're right. the two we northerners don't like having no. the mickey taken out exactly we? yeah we'll call it out whereas yeah. in the south people just go it's fine I don't want any fuss just, just yeah people, just, but that's just very Brit me. it's very British isn't it I'm not creative us uh, but it's a lot of restaurants they say at the bottom service not included and boy do they mean it sometimes service <laughs> has <laughs> service has collapsed in some of these establishments. I have the joy of eating some of the finest establishments a lot of those have gone downhill yeah. tremendously over the last things I think you have to be if you're a service industry you need to deliver 
on that service. Yeah, and that requires good managers Absolutely. who are prepared to train staff and hold them to account if they're doing a rubbish job. Absolutely. Now, uh, let's just talk a little bit about Valentine's Day ah. before we go. I'm sure you've been excited. Uh, do you have any plans for Valentine's I, Day? Every day is Valentine's Day for me. Uh, they talk about the goat, but it's the greatest of all time. I will gloat. I'll be the greatest lover of all time. <laughs> uh, you, could, you could work on that. No, but, uh, but I love romance. Romance is, is not dead. <laughs> no, I'm quite scared. I'm going to come to you quite quickly. You're married. Do you have a couple of kids? Well, we're not actually married, oh, how uh, but we, of we, we are, uh, we've been together 14 years, um, and I am allergic to Valentine's Day, Ooh. and I put a ban on it in my late 20s. I just will not celebrate it. I, I'm just Why not, not interested. It's just so phony, isn't it? Yes. Like, just be nice to each other the rest of yeah. the year. You don't have to, like, just the thought of going out with loads of other couples, everyone's sat there looking, oh, why are we having to pay this massive bill? And <laughs> I'm very unromantic, and it's just not my thing. Is your partner <laughs> the same as you? Uh, he's more romantic than me, yeah. but, you know, he's quite... He doesn't believe in, in Valentine's Day either, so we're, yeah. we're quite happy on that score. No, as well, though. We owe a little bit of realism to end the show. <laughs> a bit depressing, though, wasn't it? Oh, I think <laughs> love is in the air. We're, we're going to do that. I, it's going to be glorious. Well, love. in that beef baked at Alaska yeah. and arrange yourself a little ducky that's what they say <laughs> well love is in the air thank you so much uh, for watching today we've come to the end of the show uh, coming up next is GB News Live with Mark Longhurst I'm Bev Turner I'll see you tomorrow at 10